Come with me as I dig in deep to Apple's 2023 16-inch MacBook Pro with a top-of-the-line M2 Max processor. Welcome, everybody. Welcome to Apple Insider. It is Andrew here, and as I said, this is Apple's new 2023 MacBook Pro. This is the 16-inch model with the top-of-the-line M2 Max processor on the inside with the 38 core GPU. Now there are other upgrades I could have opted for, including up to an eight terabyte SSD. I only chose a terabyte and I could have gone up to 96 gigs of memory. I only opted for 64. Most people aren't gonna need the 96. But in this video, I'm going to be doing two things. I'm gonna be going very in depth in terms of benchmarks, performance, thermal limitations, but I'm also going to try to break down what that means for all of you, the actual users who are using this machine and how much some of this makes a difference and how much it doesn't make a difference. So please stick with me, use the chapter markers down below if you'd like to navigate to certain sections, and let's dig into this. To kick things off, let's go ahead and talk about the design of this machine and what's changed from the prior generation. Cue the slow panning side shots. That's the ticket right there. On the left-hand side of the machine, we still have our MagSafe 3 slot, though now it is color matched. If you opt for the space gray version like I did, now the MagSafe 3 cable will be space gray as well. Then you have two Thunderbolt 4 ports that are type C and a headphone jack. On the right side of the machine, you're gonna find the SDXC card reader, another type C Thunderbolt 4 port and an HDMI port. This year, Apple did move from HDMI 2.0 to HDMI 2.1. What that means for you as users is you can connect external displays at up to 8K resolution, or you can connect there a 4K display at up to 240 Hertz. Both of those new supported resolutions and frame rates will only work using that HDMI port, not the Thunderbolt ports. This is gonna be really helpful for very high-end workflows or for anyone who's gaming on a Mac, which I know is not a lot of people, uh, but anyone who wants those really high refresh rates or that high resolution display. Right now, there's not a ton of 240 Hertz displays or 8K displays, though they do exist. And I saw several of them at CES that might be launching this year or next year. But if you're buying a machine and you think maybe in the next few years that's gonna be moving into your workflow, then it makes sense. But right now, there's not a ton of use for that upgraded HDMI port. Otherwise, the laptop's the same in terms of its physical size and dimensions. You still have your large glass trackpad, the very nice keyboard that lacks the touch bar. It does still get quite a bit of you know, finger oils on the keys, even if you're a frequent hand washer. Uh, so that's just something to be aware of. There's, there's no way around it. Just clean your machine from time to time. Uh, you still have the gorgeous 16.2 inch display that has the notch in the center that houses the standard built-in FaceTime camera. The FaceTime camera, it's still nothing to write home about. It, it, it is 1080p like the last generation model, but it's still just mid. Uh, that's really how I can describe it. Honestly, I get better performance just using something like the Belkin little adapter here, pop that on top, grab my iPhone, uh, whether you've got an iPhone 14 Pro, 13 Pro, or whatever phone you have, but just using these cameras and continuity camera as the webcam instead of the built-in uh, FaceTime camera, it, the 1080p is just okay, the quality is okay. I think you get better performance out of using your phone sensor. It's just a larger camera sensor here on the back of this guy. Um, that's really what I would prefer. The, the camera just built in, it's just okay. Not, not great by any means. Before getting to the M2 Max performance, uh, let's talk about any other changes on this machine compared to last generation model. Apple now has moved from Bluetooth 5 to Bluetooth 5.3, not going to make a big difference in terms of day-to-day -day use. There could be some peripherals that'll start supporting this. Again, more future-proofing than anything, but it's not gonna make a huge difference for any accessories you have now, uh, including your AirPods, anything like that. I haven't noticed any improved performance on those with the new machines uh, versus the last generation units. Then Apple has moved to Wi-Fi 6E. This is greatly appreciated and honestly a little behind where a lot of the market already was. So Wi-Fi 6E is going to be adopting the six gigahertz band alongside 2.4 and five. This is gonna be super helpful in places like cities and apartment buildings that already have a plethora of wireless networks already going on. Now that you can take advantage of that new band, you're gonna be able to get better speeds and performance at your home. 
But even if you don't have a Wi-Fi 6E network, you're still gonna get performance improvements. Here at my house, I'm still on Wi-Fi 6. I have a Wi-Fi 6 mesh network. I tested this compared to the Wi-Fi 6 version, my last generation 16 inch MacBook Pro, and I got much better speeds. And I did the same thing on the 14 inch units that I already compared. And you can see, I, I went from like mid 400 down to now over 600 down. Now technically we have like gigabit down here, but on the wireless network, there's gonna be interference and, and everything like that. But still, it's a 200 megabit per second increase in my download speeds and just doing nothing but upgrading to the, to the new laptops. So same physical location, same network, much better performance. I'm very happy that Apple has moved to Wi-Fi 6E. So here's the part where I think a lot of you are excited to learn about, the performance of the M2 Max. I'm gonna talk about the performance in general of the M2 Max, compare it to the previous generation M1 Max, and we'll even talk about just general usability and what it's like to actually use the new processors and how much of a difference they make. Let's start off with some benchmarks. In Geekbench 5, our single core scores increased from 1671 to 2065, roughly a 20% improvement there. On the multi-core scores, we also went from, again, 12404 to 15434. So these can change a little bit test to test, but those are what we're seeing. And again, that is nearly a 20% performance gain for the M2 Max over the M1 Max. Cinebench R23 echoed these results, showing another gain for the multi-core performance going from 11 and 966 to 14808. Again, 20% performance jump, which is just in line with what Apple is offering. So my last generation model, it had the 32 core GPU on the M1 Max. The new MacBook Pros have up to a 38 core GPU, which is what I have here. So we're gonna be comparing the top of the line M1 Max to the new top of the line M2 Max. So looking at the graphical performance inside of the Geekbench 5 uh, Metal Compute GPU test, the last model scored a 68,904, and now it is a whopping 8,215. That's a 13,000 point gain, which is nearly, again, 20% improvement for those graphics. In terms of actually using the machine, I had no hiccups. I'm scrubbing through 8K video inside a Final Cut 20 minute long project. Everything is buttery smooth. Editing massive, large 45 megapixel raw photos inside of Affinity Photo. Everything just felt smooth, moving in and out, just adjusting everything. It was great. And it, it was great as well on the prior generation. So in a lot of these kind of, even what used to be a high-end workflow has really kind of maxed out for these typical tasks. So editing those large photos and basic 8K projects were fine on the last gen and new generation machine, but we can push things further. So I loaded up a video project inside of Final Cut Pro. I first started with a 4K video. It was 20 minutes long. I exported this on the new MacBook Pro and it took me just under five minutes, four minutes and 59 seconds to be exact. And then I did the exact same thing off the internal SSD of the last generation model, exact same project. And this time it took seven minutes and 14 seconds, two whole minutes more than what the new M2 Max was capable of doing. But what about an 8K project? This time I loaded an 8K project into Final Cut Pro. I only did a five minute video here because it could take very long for like a 20 minute or longer 8K video. So for a five minute 8K video, it took just about 20 minutes on the new MacBook Pro, but it took over 25 minutes on the prior generation with the M1 Max. So five minutes quicker on exporting that five minute 8K video. What I really wanna talk about in terms of performance benchmarks though, is our very involved stress test. So for this benchmark, I take Cinebench R23 and I run it back to back to back. In fact, I run it 10 consecutive times with no break in between each one for the processor or the machine to cool down. While the benchmark is running, I'm taking note of several things. So to start, I'm gonna note each score that each test resulted in and monitoring those over time. So as the performance is being taxed for longer periods, is that score decreasing? I'm also watching everything from the fan speed to the CPU temperatures, to the power draw, to the frequency of the CPU itself. And I'm comparing all of these to see how the thermal limitations are impacting the machine, how far it can be pushed, how much power is being drawn, and what things that we can pull out of that. 
So this is what I found. As soon as I started running Cinebench R23 on just even the first run, the CPU temperature jumped up to roughly 205 degrees. Over the course of these 10 runs, again, about two hours to do all of these, the CPU temperature maxed out at around 209 degrees and it got as low as 204, but it pretty much stayed consistency consistently within that window as it was running. Additionally, I saw the speed of the processor jump up and max out at about 3.2 gigahertz, which is much more than the three gigahertz of the last generation M1 Max. So we're getting a higher clock speed on the new chipset. With the M2 Max running at a higher clock speed, we are drawing a little bit more power. It was averaging at about 34 watts of power, though it maxed out about 40 a time or two during the duration of the test. The old chip was averaging about 28 watts of power and peaking at around 32. So what's crazy is during all of this, the performance barely even changed. I did get the highest score on that first test at 14,732, but even by the end, it was not much lower. I mean, we still had 14,549 as our last test. So technically there is some thermal drawback to here. Like I never got to that peak score as it did on the first time. So there was a thermal hit to the performance of the machine. But again, we're talking about maxing out the CPU for the course of two hours, and we're still getting these incredibly high scores. And I was very happy with that. But also, we have new performance, higher clock speeds, and more power draw. And Apple even decreased the size of the heatsink on the inside. But Apple rearranged it a little bit to increase that dispersion of heat away from the processor. So when I used my radar or my, my laser uh, temperature gun to measure the top casing as well as the bottom casing of the machine, I was shocked. We were only getting about 109 degrees on the top of the machine, which was right behind the... Um, the fast forward button, that was the hottest spot on my machine, and flipping it over on the bottom casing, it wasn't any higher. It was 104 degrees at the hottest point, which again was about right here or so, uh, where the heat sinks are kind of pulling things away. You have your chips in the middle, and things kind of pull out towards the sides where the fans are, and we're expelling that air from the top of the unit. This is so much better than the old design, like the 2016 MacBook Pros with a touch bar that used to get hotter, like above like 150 degrees. I saw some people report on social media. So if you're using on this lap, at most you're getting 104 degrees uh, Fahrenheit of temperature there, which is not bad at all. So let's put a bow on this. The new 2023 MacBook Pro with the M2 Max processor and a 38 core GPU. Apple did a lot of things here. Basically, it took that last generation model and it fixed a lot of things that could have been fixed. It increased the amount of memory that can be used, going up to 96 gigs. We have things like Wi-Fi 6E, HDMI 2.1, Bluetooth 5.3, as well as improved performance on the GPU and CPU side. Considering this was supposed to launch at the end of 2022, and instead slipped to 2023, those are some ridiculously good performance gains for Apple Silicon that's on the inside of this machine. I don't think it makes sense for many users on the last generation model to jump to this one unless you had a very, very high-end workflow and you were really running into limitations there, but I, I'm pretty sure those people are few and far between. I think the last generation model is perfectly fine for people, and if you can find it even at a discount, it's worth picking up. But if you have an older model, the 2016 design phase through those years, this is absolutely worth upgrading for. I don't think it's worth waiting for another redesign or an OLED model. Apple polished that last generation model from 2021, and I think they've done a fantastic job. Performance is killer. This is a great MacBook Pro. Let me know what you guys think. If you'd like to pick one up for yourself, there are some links and deals posted in the uh, description and pinned in the comments. Otherwise, find me on Twitter at Andrew underscore OSU, and I'll catch you next time.